Hey friends, welcome to the Make Life Matter podcast. I'm Angela Donatio, and each week I share compelling conversations with leading voices. They encourage us to ground our worth in the word instead of the narrative of the world. Together we'll make our lives matter no matter what. Here's this week's episode. Welcome back to the podcast, guys. And today we are talking about holy unhappiness. And you might think, well, wait a minute, is that an oxymoron? No, it's not. I cannot wait for you to hear this conversation. What does it mean to be blessed? Sometimes it's a loaded word and sadly a hijacked word. Are Christians entitled to happiness and fulfillment and perfect peace? Well, Amanda Held Opelt is a songwriter. She is a speaker. She's a writer. And in a new book, Holy Unhappiness, God, God's Goodness, and the Myth of the Blessed Life, she explores these questions that we've already asked. What does it mean to be blessed? Are we entitled? She challenges false teaching, and she helps us reimagine what the blessed life can be like if we release some of our expectations and we seek God in places that we never thought to look. Amanda, it is such an honor to have you here on the podcast. Welcome to the Make Life Matter podcast. Thank you, Angela. It's great to be here today. Well, congratulations on your new book. It's been out for a couple of months, but I take the summer off. So this is my brand new season for the fall. And you talk about your own experience in the book of disillusionment when things did not go the way that you expected. So many of us can relate to this. So can you share a little bit of your own story, Amanda, with us and how you came to put pen to paper for those that are longing for this life of authentic faith? Yeah. You know, I think that I was one of those people that kind of thought that if I, you know, made all the right decisions and kind of grew in wisdom and knowledge of the Lord, like if I just had a structurally sound theology and I was rigorously committed to the spiritual disciplines, I thought that my life would be happy. I thought I could kind of control my outcomes to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And like many of your listeners, I'm you know, familiar with the prosperity gospel, which is this, this belief, this iteration of American Protestant Christianity that says, God doesn't want you to be in pain. God doesn't want you to be sad. He doesn't want you to be poor. He doesn't want you to be unwell. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be wealthy. And so if you just you know, have enough faith and declare a word of faith. You can manifest blessings in your life and manifest health, manifest wealth. God wants you to have these things. Well, I rejected that prosperity gospel outright. Like that was something that I said was, was untrue. I, I knew that suffering was part of the Christian life. I knew that we have hard days. I know that bad things can happen to us and that God is with us and that God dignifies our suffering to degree. So it's, it, but it's like, I believed this kind of more subtle spinoff of the prosperity gospel. It's something I call the emotional prosperity gospel, Mm -hmm. which is this belief that God might not make me healthy and he might not make me wealthy, but he does want to make me happy. He wants to give me good feelings. He wants to give me emotional prosperity. And so when I came into my, you know, early to mid thirties and realized that I had made all these good decisions, I had ticked all the boxes. I had kind of the life I always always wanted on paper, you know, I married a nice Christian man and I had a good job in the Christian ministry. And yet I was still, I was still struggling. I was struggling with tension sometimes in my relationships, uh, boredom in my work, in my ministry, disillusionment Mm -hmm. from time to time. And I just thought, what did I do wrong? I felt like a failure. I must've failed because I thought I did all the right things. And, and that's that processing that disappointment and that restlessness and some of those difficult feelings is what really set me up to write this book. Mm, It's so, so good. There's so much even just right there, the doctrine of suffering, this entitlement that we have even in our own constitution. And I know people listen to this podcast all over the world, but here in the United States, we even have the pursuit of happiness as part of our rights. And so we inadvertently let that bleed into our relationship with the Lord. I was telling Amanda earlier, as we were just chatting, I travel all over the world and you really do see um, this kind of propped up Americanized gospel that is not consistent and congruent, number one, with just true biblical theology and what a lot of Christians are experiencing the way of persecution and understanding of suffering. And you also hinted at something that is so crucial because underneath this 
or the result of this becomes bondage for us. It becomes like you said, what did I do wrong? Where did I fail? And that is not God's heart for us to live in this sense of, okay, I must not have enough faith. And I've talked to people who've walked through that. They've lost a child or they're struggling with a health issue. I myself have been through nearly losing my life. And people said those things. Well, maybe if you just had enough faith, if you had more faith and all that does is heap more condemnation, mm. more frustration onto you. So let's talk a little bit about um, just a little bit more about some of the areas, even in your life, as you've longed for significant faith, and authentic faith, you have really had a, a, an intentional process of spiritual formation that has pushed back on this prosperity teaching. So give us a little bit of insight into what your practices look like mm. for spiritual formation, because we're going to talk about some of the downfall, the pitfalls of this negativity of this prosperity teaching. But I also want to just hear Look, this is what I put in place instead of it. These are like mm. authentic spiritual formation practices. Selfishly, I want to hear it, but I'm sure my listeners would love to hear it as well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think I think reading the Bible now through the lens of disappointment, through the lens of disillusionment. Like I think when we go to scripture, we're looking for the victory. We're looking for the celebration. We're looking for the, um, you know, the, the unadulterated optimistic praise. Mm. But I started saying, what, what would happen if I read the scripture through the lens of loss? If I read the scripture through the lens of suffering? And that actually was something I had to do because I, I know I mentioned earlier that my life on paper had been kind of this kind of perfect, ticking all the boxes, everything I'd ever wanted until I hit my mid to late thirties. And then I started to suffer through a season of very profound losses. One was a season of infertility, which eventually resulted in three miscarriages. Uh, and, and most catastrophically, I lost my only sibling, uh, very suddenly to a sudden illness. And that was the atom bomb that went off in my life. And so suddenly my spiritual practices were infused by grief by feeling lost, by feeling disoriented in my own life. And as I, as I turn to scripture, I, I think that, it, I mean, obviously reading the Bible, that's something that we all know is a spiritual discipline that's, that's important, necessary, the habitual encounter with the word of God, but to, to do it knowing that it speaks to the whole person, to, mm. to knowing and trusting that it speaks even to my pain. Suddenly I saw grief all over the Bible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I saw and I read that one third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Um, I also started noticing where God displays negative or uncomfortable emotions. God is a very emotive God. I think we have this image of God as like, well, he is sovereign Lord. He's control of all things. And so therefore we can't quite compute that he may also be an emotive God, a God with a lot of emotions that that's cognitively dissonant for us to believe mm -hmm. that, but it's true. We see him in the old Testament experiencing things like regret for having made man anger. He's crying out. There are times where he compares himself to a woman in labor. He's crying out. He's in so much pain over the loss of relationship with Israel even Jesus, we see Jesus yes. as a very emotive, fully human incarnate God uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, so de desperate at the prospect of the cross that he is sweating drops of blood, having what some people have called a panic attack in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what did he cry out on the cross? It wasn't everything happens for a reason, I guess, or the sun will come out tomorrow or faith over fear or, you know, all those kind of um, platitudes that we tend to incorporate in times of sorrow in Christ's moment of deepest grief. What did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And so we see almost this indulgence of negative emotions that are then infused by hope, infused mm. by the truth of our redemption and new creation to come. And so it's not the way I've learned to, to kind of accept my spiritual journey now is that my faith doesn't make all my feel my hard feelings go away. Yeah. My, my my faith doesn't kind of alleviate the feelings, but my faith informs the feelings. That's my good. faith equips me to carry those difficult emotions season to season. And and so that's I guess again the, the spiritual disciplines, if that's what you're asking, is reading the Bible with a fully open mind that it's going to speak to every 
area of your life, every, every complexion of your emotions, it's going to speak to and going to answer to. Mm, So, so good. If you go back to the Psalms, even like you said, Psalms of lament, giving us permission Mm -hmm. to grieve in his presence. And what, what we find is what to do with our loss. I mean, Mm -hmm. loss and grief and pain can be a catalyst for a deeper, more meaningful relationship with the Lord but your perspective on it is going to make a huge difference. If you believe while I'm experiencing loss, I'm experiencing disappointment, I'm Mm -hmm. experiencing anxiety, something must be wrong with me. Inwardly, we're looking at self again, rather than, okay, God, you tell me to cast all my cares on you. Tell me to come to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, You tell me to um, know that in you there, I will have trouble but yes. you have overcome the world. You mentioned Jesus. I mean, he's called a suffering savior. Yes. I'm encouraged that it says he is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He doesn't say yeah. don't, don't have feelings. He says, yeah. I understand them. I walked through them. I recognize them. I know what that's going to be like. And I can give you supernatural peace and supernatural joy that, that doesn't make sense in the face of difficulty. Yeah. But if you look for happiness, in circumstances, you will constantly be disappointed. Yeah. My husband preaches that happiness really comes from the root word of happenings, mm-hmm. meaning if things are great, I feel happy. If they're not great, like honestly, Amanda, to speak to what you're saying, anybody can have faith. And I'm putting in air quotes. And if you're, if you're watching, anyone can have faith when everything is great. Yeah. Because then really what you have faith in is faith. But yeah. true faith is an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, which which is good, bad, no matter what, I'm going to still believe that God is good, even when life is not. And what what I think we inadvertently do is put God's character on trial when difficulty happens, Mm -hmm. because we have, like you said, a discongruent approach. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's good. And this isn't. So maybe he's not actually good. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Rather than separating those two things and understanding that we can hold those tensions simultaneously. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is because I did the same thing. I absolutely put God on trial when my Mm. sister died and when I I lost my, my pregnancies Mm. and you know, it's really, gosh, I wish we had a longer view of life because I sometimes think that like whatever we're feeling in the moment, we think this is how it's going to be forever. What even, even how our faith is like, I'm experiencing doubt in this moment. Therefore my faith is wrecked. It's over. Mm -hmm. I've fallen away from the Lord. I actually think God has patience for us when we put him on trial. Job put God on trial and, and what did God do? He said he, he engaged, he engaged in that trial and said, this is who I am. Yes. There was maybe some correction that happened there, but I think the goal, I think God's goal for us is always intimacy. What, 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 I love that story of Jacob in the Bible where he is out in the wilderness and he's, he's kind of messed up his whole life. He's been clamoring and clawing up for a blessing his whole life. He thought he was entitled to it his whole life. He stole his brother's birthright. He kind of tricked his father-in-law, all these things. So now he's out in the wilderness and he's demanding the blessing from God mm-hmm. and God engages. God gets into this wrestling match with Jacob and Jacob is demanding a blessing. I will not let you leave until you give me a blessing. Mm. And, and God does, he gives Jacob a new name. And that new name is a name of intimacy and closeness of, with God. The P it means, you know, Israel, the people of God and he, Israel means he who wrestles with God. Mm-hmm. And so I guess, I think what I would tell people if they're struggling, if they feel like they're trying not to put God on trial, but they can't help themselves in some ways that there's this mm-hmm. sense in which I'm just not sure. And I have questions and everything that used to be so clear. I'm not sure if it's clear anymore. Are you wrestling with God? Are you wrestling? Because God actually, I think allows for that. God will give you a new name. And if that wrestling with God results in intimacy with God, mm-hmm. deeper trust in God, deeper knowledge of God, deeper vulnerability with God, then be patient with yourself because I think the fruit of that can be good. That's so good, Amanda. That's really the crux right there. Because when we wrestle disappointment, doubt, unmet expectations, deep loss, like you've experienced, we really have two options. We either have God isn't good. I'm going to withdraw from him. Or we have, like you said, leaning into him and it actually creates a deeper relationship with him the choice really becomes ours. And that idea that you just express of being patient with yourself 
as you're going through this journey with the Lord and knowing that he invites us to bring mm-hmm. our questions, our pain, process it with him. Yeah. And the goal of that then would be deeper, more meaningful relationship with him, mm-hmm. even when things don't turn out yeah, the way that's right. that, that we want them to. Yeah. We have our, our student ministries pastor is 31 and is on his fourth year with ALS. So we are walking through um, hand to hand with them, Mm. um, what it looks like to believe in a loving, good God when life is not good. And when you Mm. have three little girls and a terminal illness of ALS, Mm. it's, it's not easy. These are not the easy conversations to have. It would be easier to throw platitudes. All things work together for God, you know, for good, for those who love God. And they do, Mm -hmm. but we have a role to play in our perspective. And we need to honor people's pain. Pain is pain. And when we're going through it, it is not always an indictment of, oh, you didn't have faith. You didn't believe in the Lord. Think about the the, uh, the story in the gospels where the, my, the man is blind and, and they ask the disciples, well, who sinned, him or his mm-hmm. parents? I mean, there's yeah. an already instinctive belief system in place systemically that if something is wrong, it must be wrong with you Yeah, rather yeah. than we live in a fallen world that is not designed to prevent suffering. Yeah. So making peace with that yeah. is crucial to living in peace, period. How are you going to yeah. have supernatural peace if you can't make peace with that? And knowing, like you said, have a long view of things. This is such a temporary life that we live and you're going to have suffering in it. I wish we didn't. I wish we, Amanda and I could say to you as listeners, you come to Christ and all of your problems go away, but that's disingenuous. And it's going to leave you so disillusioned when Mm. things don't go the way, when you plug in the formula and it doesn't work because there isn't a formula. And as you said, Amanda, the scripture reveals this over and over people wrestling with God, wrestling with grief, wrestling with loss, and whether we're going to come out on the other side of that with a more deeper relationship with the Lord. And and that's what he's desiring. So let's lean on a little bit more to some of the specifics of this book, because it's Mm -hmm. just such a rich, meaningful book. Uh, Mm -hmm. American Christians have developed this long list of expectations. You mentioned entitlement about what the life with God will feel like. Let's go back to this kind Mm -hmm. of emotional prosperity, which we are so feelings based in the United States, especially so many Christians rightly denied the prosperity gospel as you did this idea that God wants us to be healthy and wealthy, but we embrace this more subtle spinoff, what you call the emotional prosperity gospel or the belief that God wants us to always experience happiness and fulfillment. Okay. So man, I want you to just lean into this a little bit more and why it's dangerous for us to equate happiness with holiness, because in your title is the idea of holiness. So draw, connect that dot for us. It's dangerous for for us to think that holiness and happiness need to go side by side. Yeah. Well, I think it was just that I thought that, you know, I could somehow it was it was almost a, an, a move of the apologetics drive within me. It's like, as a child, I was raised, I think, in the height of the apologetics movement in the mm. late 90s and early 2000s. And I wanted to, I wanted to prove to the world that God was real, that he was trustworthy. I wanted to win converts. I wanted to do all these things. And what part of the way I thought I could do that was by being happy, by being optimistic, by being be, by getting holier, 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 holier. Like I was filled with joy, filled with positivity and that people would be attracted to that positivity. And that is a little bit more of an American kind of value, this idea of constant optimism. It's this belief that like, you know, we are a self-help generation. It is, it's yeah. a feature of modernity to believe that we can always be improving, always getting better, always optimizing. If there's something bad that happens to you, then you there's a, gotta be a life hack for it. Like we like to mm-hmm. circumvent the pain and go straight to the brighter horizons in this country. It's, it's, it's within our DNA. I would say this country that was built off this narrative 
imperative of the pursuit of happiness. Okay. And so what I realized though, is that like, I actually think what the world is hungry for is people who are honest about the realities of life and that, you know, going back to that idea of lament, I used to think that lament was like a secondary form of worship that it was like, you know, you got celebration up here, but lament is down here. You know, lament is kind of the thing we do when, you know, it kind of as a last resort, but I've come to believe that worship is just anytime we agree with God, we're worshiping. Anytime Mm -hmm. we come into one accord with God, we're worshiping. And so when we lament that there is injustice in the world, when we lament that there's violent and violence in the world, when we lament death, death isn't was never the plan. Death is an aberration. Death is the enemy. When we lament death, when we lament racial injustice, when we lament our own grief, you know, and our own um, doubt, when we lament those things, I think that is a high, high, high form of worship. And Michael Card even says it's, it's the path to worship. Lament is the path to worship because we are standing in agreement with God and saying, this is not how it should be. Violence is not the way. Injustice is not the way. Righteousness is the way. Peace is the way. Mm -hmm. And so I think what the world wants isn't happiness. I think what the world wants is hope. And I make a pretty clear distinction between the two, because it's not that I don't think God wants us to be joyful or peace filled. We know that's the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. There is a tranquility of spirit that comes Mm -hmm. with time spent with the Lord. But what hope does is hope names both the hard and the good hope, hope names how things are in the presence, the darkness and all and looks ahead to the light that is to come. It looks ahead to the promise of new creation. And so that to me is just a very distinct difference. Happiness is one of those things that kind of comes and it goes, and it's kind of based on the individual emotion of, in the moment. Whereas hope to me is based on the communal good. It's based on what, what, what is the thing that we are all moving towards? What is the righteousness, the light, the goodness, the justice that we are all communally moving towards together? And sometimes that means naming the darkness and naming what's hard in the moment. So I kind of make that distinction in the book. That is so good. There is so much in that what you just said right there would preach for weeks. That it's just so insightful. Um, there's a marriage book that says, What if God designed marriage to make you holy than more than to make you happy? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's so crucial that we separate out our false understanding of holiness that and and you 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 really gave us a path to your own if i could just be better if mm-hmm. i can just be more holy i grew up very legalistic and perfectionistic and i just kept thinking if i just am am perfect god is going to love me more mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then we equate and that's going to mean <clears throat> a blessed life and all of these external things that demonstrate holiness will somehow guarantee blessing in my life yeah now I want to back up for a second because it, it you do mention that you do believe we should dignify, um, you know that that you don't believe we should always we're always going to experience happiness and that's mm-hmm. not necessarily uh, God's heart and intent for us. But you acknowledge the desire, the dignity of desiring happiness. Yeah. So I want to talk about the distinction and you plead for this normalization of some of these uncomfortable feelings as a Christian. So yeah. help us understand if someone's a little confused, like, okay, so should I, should I just be content being sad or being, um, experiencing all these negative emotions? Is it wrong for me to desire, like you said, the fruits of the spirit? So help us find that mm-hmm. fine line and how we can dignify this desire yeah. for happiness. Yeah, it's such a good question, Angela, because I I have found that as like we've begun to dignify suffering and name suffering more in our culture and, you know, therapy's good and all we're all dealing with our trauma or whatever. It's easy to then just stay there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and I I've heard that phrase. God is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. That made me for a long time think God didn't want me to be happy at all. He just wanted me to be holy. And I just I don't think that's true. I actually think God wants us to be both. Like, I think Mm -hmm. I just think that life is filled with both of the things and both, both hard things and happy things. I just think that 
what we've done in our culture is that we've assigned happiness to some of these kind of containers of meaning. Like if you, if you can just find a job that you love and feel important in your work and, you know, feel like you're doing something meaningful, then you'll be happy. Whereas I just think happiness maybe comes to with the submission to some of the simpler pleasures in life, mm. relationship and the goodness of, of the world and the, the beauty that's all around us, the things that are freely given. I just, I don't think happiness is necessarily something you have to earn. And that to me feels like the, the, the biggest flip is that we live in kind of this uh, meritocratous society where it's like you earn your happiness, you work right. hard, you make all the right decisions, you're a good person. So you're able to earn money, buy the things, build a happy life for yourself. And I just kind of think, you know what? It's stop striving. Your belovedness belongs to you just by virtue of you being a child of God. Amen. It's that biblical anthropology that, you know, we, we tend to think about, um, the imputed sin more than anything. It's like we, we've just been given this sin nature by Adam that we got to somehow get rid of. And I'm not saying that brokenness isn't part of all of our lives, but what I'm saying is belovedness is there too. Yes. Belovedness as given to us by our divine creator. We are image bearers and he has made a good and beautiful world for us to be to live in yes there's brokenness because of the fall yes there's horrible injustice but there is beauty all around us and so for me happiness has become less about me striving and achieving and trying to be a better person and build a better life and be a more important person and it's more about just noticing noticing the sky above me how beautiful it is the the taste of an apple pie, like the laughter of my daughter, this daughter that I longed for all these years, mm. this the companionship of my husband. Yep, yeah, marriage is hard. It just is. I have a whole chapter about it. But mm. goodness, the companionship, the laughter that we share. So to me, now happiness is less about something I earn and strive for and more about a grace that's given. And can I be present in that moment in those freely given graces? And can I receive them as a gift from the Lord? Can I revel in them as as a gift from the Lord. Mm, so good, Amanda. I just could not possibly say any of this any better than you, than you are. And it's obvious that it's within you. It's such a deep, like you have lived this, you have come through this. It, it's not just something you thought, let me write a book on a topic. Like this is what you have lived. And so you're imparting that to us living in the grace of God's goodness even when we even when life is not good. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done through this book, through your life, through your intention to help us to live really authentically in our faith mm. with Jesus Christ, which is so freeing to truly live then um, in the light of his goodness and his grace. So another way that you make your life matter for the kingdom is your work with nonprofit and humanitarian. So talk about that a little bit, Your the, the, the sectors of humanitarian work. How has that kind of intersected your faith life? And uh, just bring us into that for a minute. Yeah, I worked in, um, you know, kind of an, an urban context when I first got done with college and worked with women who were struggling with intergenerational uh, poverty, uh, generational poverty, and some of the um, just the marginalization of what it is to 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 live in this society with some of the injustices. And so it was just kind of this exposure to me that all of a sudden I had this idea that, well, anybody that just works hard can get ahead. What's, you know, what's the problem here? And suddenly I realized that some people are are born with some real disadvantages and and real challenges that are very very difficult to overcome. So it was just kind of like a okay, I'm, my my understanding of suffering is kind of broadening a little bit. Um, and and then I I worked in humanitarian aid. I did staff care for international aid workers and traveled to some of the most you know so, to war torn countries to disaster zones and saw suffering at kind of this grand scale yeah. and yeah. to see to see the global church at work in those contexts was really a cushion for my own faith as I've gone through my own deconstruction, something I don't really feel like I, I chose. It's just questions I had and nagging doubts that I had and trying to be faithful to the Lord in that. What mm -hmm. really cushioned that journey was seeing the global church at work, seeing, hey, this hope that we have is able to survive disaster, war. It's able to survive in many contexts, in many cultures. It's so much bigger than American Christianity. Yeah. And so that that has really informed both my view of suffering, but also my understanding of the Christian faith. So, so good. So good, Amanda. 
So you mentioned Jacob, you mentioned a couple a couple of other biblical passages and and uh, principles that have mattered to you, but I always like to ask my guest other than Jesus who you have mentioned in the garden gives us mm-hmm. such um a model for what to do with our suffering, our pain, our questions. But other than Jesus, who in the Bible has most inspired you to make life matter? Who is mm-hmm. that person for you? Well, I just did a talk on Martha from the gospels. Mm-hmm. And so I, she's on my mind and I, I feel, I feel for Martha in the same way I feel for Thomas, these yeah. two characters that are often remembered for their worst moments. That we remember them by their monikers, doubting Thomas or busy body Martha, who was yeah. too busy trying in the kitchen, trying to be the perfect host to sit at the feet of Jesus. And I'm just empathetic. For her, because later in the Gospels and John, when her brother dies, she's the one that has enough faith to go out and meet Jesus and say, I know you can still make him well. And Jesus says, who do you believe I am? And she says, you are the one given by God. You are the Messiah. You are like, it's one of the most definitive declarations of the divinity Mm -hmm. of Jesus in all of the Gospels. And it comes from Martha, who we remember as this kind of mean bossy older sister yeah you know what I mean but I'm 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 thinking of her because when Jesus she comes to Jesus and says I feel unseen in my striving Mm -hmm. I feel unseen I I feel all alone in my Mm -hmm. efforts to do good work for you you know Jesus comes to her house her sister's sitting there listening to Jesus Martha's doing everything by herself and she feels unseen in her Mm -hmm. efforts to achieve. And so I I just love how Jesus says, Martha, Martha. I think of that as I used to think that was kind of like a scolding tone, but Jesus does it only one other time in scripture. And it's with Peter when he's praying for Peter and praying Mm -hmm. for Peter's soul. It's an empathetic a double utterance of her name, Martha, mm-hmm. Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. And those words that he uses in the Greek troubled, it, it means noise, chaos. It means to be divided among many things. And that's exactly how my heart feels. And that's why I relate to her is I feel divided. I want to do all these things for God. I want to be a great mom. I want to be in the ministry. I want to be a good Christian. I want to, be, but I also want to be still and I want to be simple. And I, you know, I want all those things and they feel like they compete and it's just noise and chaos in my head. Mm. And Jesus says, choose the one thing. Mary's chosen the one thing. And and what is the one thing? It's stillness. It's Mm -hmm. listening. It's basking in your belovedness and in in the presence of Jesus. And Mm. so Martha, and then she takes that lesson and it becomes this giant faith for her faith so strong that she believes Christ can raise her brother from the dead. And so I'm thinking of Martha, just kind of the troubled, the troubledness of my spirit, the the, the troubledness of her spirit. I can relate to her on so many levels. Wow. So good. And how many of us can relate to that? And, you know, my dad wrote and I, or my dad and I wrote a book on the life of Thomas. So we Mm a hundred percent, I echo everything you just said and how they get branded for this one moment. But Martha's moment of that came out of loss. Yeah. That was her deepest grief. And yet in the middle of her grief, she acknowledges his deity and who he is. And, yeah. and Jesus reminded her to find our worth in who he is, not in what we do. We will never fully reconcile the injustice and the pain in this world. It's just not going to happen. That's right. Um, This side of eternity, but that's the hope that you mentioned. That's why we have the hope, the promised plan of Christ for redemption, but of the eventual eternity with him. That's the hope that we have to point to. And if you're listening and you're going through a season of suffering, doubt, confusion, maybe you've walked through this false narrative that if you just do all the right things, nothing bad will happen. And that has not panned out. And so I just pray that Amanda's life and story and message has been encouraging and empowering for you today. I could not encourage you enough to get a copy of her book. Amanda, where do you want them to go to find you, to follow you and to get a copy of Holy Unhappiness? And you have other resources as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, both my books, uh, A Hole in the World, Finding Hope in Rituals of Grief and Healing, and A Holy Unhappiness, God, Goodness, and the Myth of the Blessed Life. They're both anywhere you can buy books, you know, Amazon. Uh, you can go to my publisher's website and 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 find uh, any of those places where books are sold. And then I'm I'm also online at amandaheldopelt.com, and I hang out a little bit on on Instagram and some on the the site formerly known as Twitter, but that place scares me a little bit. So know, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe find me on on Instagram. I, I like to post resources there uh, sometimes. So yeah, I'd love okay. to love to see you there. 
Yeah, I follow you there. I appreciate your your insight. And I love that you're you're just holding this tension so well of like you said, the heart and the holy. And they they do coincide. And we are called as believers to to live in that tension. And that's not always easy, but it is possible with Christ. That's that's why we have the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit to point us to Jesus and to remind us that he is the hope that we live in, even when we don't understand. So Amanda, thank you so much. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your intentionality to live a life of authentic faith. It inspires us to do that. Um, especially right here in America where we maybe don't understand, we idolize comfort and convenience um, over a called life and what Mm -hmm. that might look like. So thank you. Thank you guys go get a copy of Holy Unhappiness and uh, you know, we're going to be heading toward the end of the year. I can't hardly believe it already, but no. what a way to read this right before the end of the year, reset your intention that next year I'm, I'm going to purpose to go after God, the pursuit of God, not the pursuit of happiness. And he knows what you need before we even say it. And he's going to meet you at your place of need. So thank you, Amanda. Would you pray for our listeners, especially those who might be struggling with these feelings that we've, we've discussed today and uh, close us out in prayer. Sure. Yes, Father, who all for all who are listening that are struggling through a season of grief, maybe just restlessness or disappointment, and especially those, Lord, who are struggling with doubt and uncertainty, even about their faith. Now, would you help them to be patient with themselves? Lord, we live in a world that beats us up when we aren't certain or beats us up when we're sad and tells us to just be happy and to be sure. But you, you say that you're with us for for the whole journey pray that they would discern your wisdom on that journey that they would connect to your spirit that your spirit would guide them and hold them and equip them for all of life's up and downs all of life's seasons and lord may they find blessings in the simple graces that you've given to all of us not necessarily achievement or accomplishments but in the love and in the peace and in the hope that that you give us, Lord. I ask this in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining the conversation. If you've been inspired to make life matter, share a review and subscribe at cpnshows.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. Connect with me at angeladenadio.com, Facebook at Angela Donatio VOV, and Instagram at Angela Donatio. Until next week, let's make life matter.